Kansas City Chiefs, and that's been their won't so often tonight at a time when they desperate the their won't. W-O-N-T. Oh, Howard. The education of Dandy Don continues. We await the punt. People began to take sides, rooting between Dandy Don and Howard. But right now, to tell you in detail about the Oilers, as only he can with his Texas corn pone, Dandy Don Meredith. I never said anything ugly about you, Howard. I used to come into my office was filled with boxes of mail to get him off. And all the advertisers wanted him off. Make sure Cosell gets this picture! He stinks! Everybody thought that what does this man know about football? 61 Curly Cult. These Kansas City Chiefs, 81 doesn't look real sharp either. Upshaw. They got a lot of work ahead of them to get into shape. I'm going to take you down there and let you tell them that personally. If we see it, Giff, we got to say it. People either hated Howard Cosell or loved him. Nobody was in the middle. Come on, come on. Nobody was in the middle, including in, in, in my own profession. He drove some of the owners crazy with his remarks about this team and that team. Giff, I think when this one is over, we should go into the league offices on Wednesday, get the films of the game, and take them around to local high schools as a study in futility. Wow, that's heavy, Howard. Howard said that, America. Howard said that. In 1970, we were doing a game in Franklin Field, Philadelphia. A bitter cold night. The Giants, with a victory against the Eagles tonight, could reduce the edge to a half a game. And when we got on the air, it became apparent that Howard was having some problems. He started to slur some words. By the time we got to halftime, uh, his slurring had become fairly severe. I'm not on camera now. We're in Philadelphia at Franklin Field. The score, the New York football giants 13, the Philadelphia Eagles 9. And now we're Howard's wife, Emmy, called me during the telecast and she said, Jimmy, you listen to the game? I said, yeah. And she said, Howard doesn't sound right. So I called the truck and I talked to our producer and I said, Howard, okay? And he said, Jim, uh, Howard's uh, had too much to drink. Franklin Field, Philadelphia, 13-9 Giants, halftime score, tough game. Don Meredith, key points. Oh, I think a couple of fumbles, Howard. He had the good sense to realize you better get off the air, and he left at halftime. In case some of you fans are wondering what's happened to my friend and cohort, Howard Cosell, Howard has been sick this week. Meredith had one of his great lives. He said, yeah, how about that? He got sick all over my boots. <laughs> Howard always said after, for years after that, it was an ear infection, that he'd gone to the doctor, that he had ear problems. I can't doubt that. I can only go by what other people are saying. We wanted people to be afraid to turn Monday Night Football off and go to bed because something so outrageous would happen that everybody at the office the next day would be talking about it. Now I've got a most familiar figure and face for all of you across the country here with me now. Of the original Beatles, Mr. John Lennon. John. Originally, Howard was going to interview Reagan, but when he found out John Lennon was coming on, he said, uh, 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 Gifford, you take the governor, uh, uh, I'll take the Beatle. Uh, uh. Will the Beatles ever reunite? You never know. You never know. I mean, it's always in the wind. If it looked like this, it might be worth doing, right? You did just spend the weekend with Ringo. Yeah, and I promised him I'd mention his album out now, and I said I wouldn't mention my own, which is out now, too. Forget it. <laughs> Thank you very much, It's been John. a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Right now, we've got to rejoin the Giffer. Frank okay, Giffer. Giffer. Over to Giffer. Bye-bye. <laughs> It's Larry Smith, once of Florida. And the Howard's talents at doing the halftime highlights were measurable. He would have no script with him whatsoever except for a shot sheet to say this person ran the ball or caught the ball for X number of yards and it made the score a Y. Everything else that was said during the period of this piece was strictly off the top of Howard's head. Led by that man, number 32, O.J. Simpson, throwing the Mel Gray, the youngster from Missouri University. Mean Joe Green comes in and hits. What a ball game this was. This is Mac Harris. Look at him sneak through. Touchdown. Namath, whiskey.
bring to the center, John Schmidt. Schmidt didn't hear him. Confusion, despair, defeat. Halftime highlights took on a life of their own. Of course, everybody blamed Howard for what was on halftime highlights. It was never Howard's decision. It was the producer's decision at the time. I mean, we actually had people threatening, you know, our lives. And, and so Chet Forty and I always used to tell everybody in the press that it was Howard that picked the halftime highlights because we figured, you know, if somebody was going to get popped, it might as well be Howard. And so Howard's way of getting back was on the air saying, The NFL highlights of key games yesterday as selected by the show's producers. There were, I think, people who tuned in Monday Night Football because they hated Howard. Because they wanted to hear what he said so that they could yell at the television set. Those Monday Night Football crowds, some of them in some cities, they were animals. Sometimes he would have FBI protection. And I used to watch those games just to make sure some lunatic wasn't there with an Uzi or an AK-47 shooting up the booth. I wanted to make sure that my father got through those four plus hours every Monday night. Well, we look forward to having you aboard. I take it you viewed a nice... As the years went by on uh, the Monday Night Package, there were a few times where Howard became saddened by the criticism that he was receiving. If you are super critical uh, and if you are abrasive, that this is the automatic way to success and that, and that this is a form of journalism, which I just happen to believe that it is not. Howard did not take very well to criticism. Uh, the line I remember him saying most frequently was referring to newspaper reporters as those $10,000 a year hacks. Yeah, he got at me today. Oh, young. What did he say? Yeah, it's funny. Man's insane. Howard basically despised the print press, and he despised them not because of what they wrote about him for the most part, but apart from a few sports writers, Howard thought they were ignorant. Uh, there is no question that a certain coterie of sports writers in this country has tried to develop uh, a hate syndrome in my direction. He was a, unbelievably a, sensitive B, to the most ridiculous C, criticism imaginable. I've actually heard Howard say, I can't believe what they wrote about me in the Des Moines Register. Gifford, look what they wrote in Des Moines, Iowa, day before yesterday. Howard goes south. Uh, uh, Des Moines, Iowa. And this one from Ames. Yes, look at this from Montana. They wrote that. That's Howard goes south. I think to some degree, Howard maybe brought it on himself because he took on the press and had a war with them. I do have better command of the language and nuances and inflections than you. Yeah. Otherwise, you'd be in New York. But yeah. what's your next question? Would you like to move to Miami, Howard? No. I don't think the town could stomach you. But to get back to Chet Forty... To get back to you, that's a rude and insulting remark. What was yours just prior to that, Howard? So he was a target, and he was a bullseye, and it was, you know, hit me here. And he'd go out of his way to some way fan that flame, but at the end of the day, I think he paid the price in the amount of criticism that he got. You stir them up. Stir them up to what? I said, don't get me on the phone. Call or write ABC. Not you, by the way, Bunky. ABC. That's the end of this interview. You look at the world attacking Howard, he created very hermetic, insular uh, places for himself, his family. He had an incredibly supportive, strong wife. Emmy was closer than a wife, closer than anyone you could imagine to Howard. Ultimately, Emmy was the only one Howard ever trusted. Emmy's my life. She has been for 28 and a half years. He wouldn't go anywhere without Emmy. Howard always wanted her at his side. Emmy could control him. I mean, I've heard her turn around. You know, Howard, you're acting like a jerk. And he, oh, 